Okay. Let me start sharing my screen. I will then make you co host. Okay. So, um, welcome everyone. Um, I hear some people are still joining. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start very um, soft and then as we get deep, everybody will be here already. So today I'm gonna be talking about a few of the things that I, I think are still um, areas of much interest to really explore inside VR because they, they haven't been solved yet. Um, so what we're seeing, I'm oh, sorry, here, um, a bit about me, right? I've been all over the place. Um, um, actually, I was in Airbus in Bristol, very close to Swansea uh, for a while. Um, and also in Cardiff, right, the, the Newport office. Um, and well, since 2016, I'm with Microsoft. I'm at Microsoft Research, and I'm exploring all these areas around virtual reality, and we'll talk more about it now. I think we're in front of a change of paradigm. Uh, that should be clear to everyone in this meeting already as you're working on um, virtual reality masterclass. Um, we're moving from the content being inside the screen to the user being inside the content. And that opens a whole new level of opportunities and also a whole new level of challenges. And, and why we're seeing this paradigm shift, I think there are multiple reasons. Um, and technologically, it's empowered by many things, right? One thing is that we have more data around us uh, located, especially, right, like um, in, in terms of um, we know, uh, for example, maps have uh, possibilities to, to remap everything into a virtual world. Um, then we're getting a lot of uh, computational power on the edge and 5G that it's allowing for content to arrive very quickly to our devices. Uh, we're getting wearables that are um, completely new line of, of computing, right? And wearables um, allow you to have hands-free, right? So that, that's one of the things that I think it's important uh, because then you, you can just carry it, carry the devices with you all time on, <laughs> right, on you versus um, a phone is something that you need to take out and it occupies your hand. And then the tracking tech, all the SLAM um, technology to, to really triangulate what you're looking at that works even on, on phones, right? The whole Pokemon Go is based on that. Um, wait a second, uh, I'm gonna ask the kid to Okay, just trying to keep the house a bit more quiet here. And, and this tracking tech allows you also to, to have untethered devices and um, it, it allows you to walk anywhere you want. So all this combination is what's changing this uh, form of interaction into spatial computing. And I think also, uh, this walks along the path together with this idea of society of devices in which all these devices are going to talk to each other, right? And, and I think all of this together is what is changing the paradigm towards spatial computing. <coughs> so, <coughs> sorry. So once we have the content, the user inside the content, there are a few things that I think are critical. One of them is authoring tools. I think authoring um, is, 
it's something that overhangs everything else that we do, right? Like, unless we have authoring tools, there is no way we can produce better avatars or better locomotion or better, uh, right? We, we already have some good authoring tools. Uh, we'll get a bit more on this. Um, then things that have to do with our new sensor experiences that we're gonna have, right? Like audio and touch. I think a lot of people work on render already of the visual. And I think the visual is actually quite uh, well satisfied um, uh, in terms of quality of rendering. I think there is still a lot to do in terms of the devices that will allow, you know, maybe retinal displays or whatever, right? Um, then the whole idea of representing others and things inside VR, um, which I call avatars, right, is, is I think, is still an area of much interest. And then another area that I find is very critical to VR is locomotion. And I don't think that's something we're going to solve anytime soon, really, because there is a mapping problem there, right? You You have a very large virtual environment in a very small physical space. And that mapping problem, it's gonna be there for the longest time. So when we go to authoring, um, you know, we have Unreal, we have Unity, they have asset stores. In a way, it's a wonder, right? Like imagine 10 years ago, nothing like that existed. Um, so it is so much better now, but it's still, it's only for computer scientists that that's kind of doing the trick. Uh, I think we need authoring tools all across the board um, for all levels, right? In order for everyone to be able to create content. Um, and I will, as I go through my presentation, I'll try to touch on the authoring around everywhere. So regarding touch, I think that is a challenge because, okay, we create these very good holograms or virtual objects. And the moment we reach them and grab them, the whole illusion breaks. So it's a, an, an issue with um, consistency and with having good experiences in, in VR. The problem we have with, the, with haptics or touch is that it could take many forms. Right, you can have a tool that allows you to uh, do this type of manipulation or grab an apple and comes to your hand whenever you're reaching towards an object or, you know, something that looks more like a, an exoskeleton or a thong um, that you will be able to, to control. So, and it takes many forms, as I was saying, for example, this one here uh, will allow you to have these levels of dexterity, right, that we want to simulate uh, inside a rigid object, right? This, this is a rigid controller. Uh, it doesn't have moving parts, which is great candidate for consumers, right? Um, and let me just show it a bit in action. So here you're moving an object. You can have force sensing, which is more than just touch. And, and you can deliver some sort of compliance into it. So this is the, the feel that people have, but you're actually delivering the simulation through the voice coil actuators uh, place here and here and then texture touch, et cetera. And you, you can find more about this work uh, around everything I, I'm presenting, you'll have here um, a good uh, corresponding um, presentation or, or publication. So then you can have things that uh, provide more this experience of um, uh, you know, the, the mobility and the really grabbing something, right, um, on your fingers. Um, and here we can deliver compliance of how, you know, how uh, elastic an object can be. The interesting thing about this device is that we move away from large motors and we use a bit of physics here with a capstan, like on the boats 
to really exert human scale forces and block your finger completely or not, uh, depending on, on the uh, elasticity of or stiffness of the object, right? And there are many things we can simulate a button, how it will click. <clears throat> uh, we can simulate um, like uh, bringing together two cubes uh, of, you know, this clicking part uh, or just cutting with scissors, right? Which is very satisfactory. I mean, um, Then another example of, of device uh, that you can build is more like an encounter type of device that comes to you whenever you need it. And, and this is also super fulfilling. Once you've done this in VR, like every other time that you come to VR, you're never gonna be able to pick an object in the same way, right? Like this is just like how it should be. Um, the problem that you can probably see already is that there are many ways to do things. Each thing fixes one of the problems and there is no really universality on, on how this is gonna look like. And if, if you look at other type of input devices, output devices like um, the mouse or the keyboard, they haven't evolved in many, many years. And here, I think we haven't yet found <clears throat> a proper solution that uh, people will say is a winner. And okay, so um, there are a few things that we found also as we were exploring all these areas. And one of them is this uncanny valley of haptics, which has to do a lot of with the expectations. Um, so if you deliver very good haptics, but the, the whole story and the very nice visual uh, correspondence is not there, then you end up in this uncanny valley of haptics. Let me explain it with an example. So imagine you're in VR and you feel the touch on the back of your shoulder. Uh, you turn around and there is an avatar and you're like, wow, right? This is incredible. Um, now imagine you're in VR, you perceive exactly the same haptic experience. You turn around and there is no one. And that breaks your illusion because you think, okay, this is something, someone that is, outside, right? And then you take off your headset and look outside and yeah, there is someone there. Um, so this idea that if you deliver very good sensory feedback, but it's not really attached to um, how the game should play, the physics of the game, or um, it really creates broken experiences too. So it's not only not having haptics that breaks the experience, it's also having haptics that do not follow the, the experience. Um, I, I'll end uh, with touch just saying that we will see many things in there, right? Like even these years in Kai, we're seeing more and more devices that solve many things like, you know, um, cutaneous uh, experiences to full force rendering to weight uh, simulation to uh, gravity simulation, right? Like you could want to do everything around that. Um, audio is another area that I think it's very much of interest because we're moving into these devices that can spatialize sound around us. They can do that because of two things. One, it has head tracking. And, and second, it generates HRTFs with the, with the spatial model of, of a head, right? So you have that in real time as you move, you can have a sound localized somewhere and you'll hear it as you move. So one of the challenges there with the HRTFs is that it's, in, it's really not possible to generate an individual HRTF for every person at the moment. And many people are advocating that generic HRTFs are maybe you know, not good for them because they need to uh, calibrate them better or you know you don't have the standard head form um, so you don't hear it well. Um, the funny thing is that we did some experiments to test that and 
um, here you can hear the sound going around. We would ask people to localize where the sound was coming from. And then there will be a series of experiences where you would calibrate, in which you could see where the sound was. And so this would be the conditions, only audio, audiovisual, audiovisual plus some physics of the ball bouncing. And overall, what we find is that when we do later, again, the task of the localization, um, participants really improved their sound localization. So the, in, in VR, I think we can be uh, working with generic HRTFs quite well because it's a multi-sensory experience. And I think that that's kind of a very interesting asset. So it's instead of calibrating the, the, the system, we can calibrate participants too, right? Similar that when you go to the movies, the speakers are down there, but you really attach whatever sound to the mouth of the um, actor, right? You're not just saying, oh, there is someone talking on my back. Uh, so we're very good at relocalizing sound to, to visual. And actually I had this um, um, friend who did this work um, on a real landscape with microphones around them and people could hear the sound from specialized locations as they are moving around the space. And, and things like pre-recording of, ah, oh, how this looks in the morning. And then you can hear the same space, but during the morning or, um, and as you turn your head, it will relocalize the spatial, right? So one of the things he found is that a lot of people who experience, I mean, the few people who experience a really non-spatial sound from the beginning and would complain like, oh, I don't hear sound correctly. Uh, after a while, after 30 minutes or 20 minutes walking, they'll come to him and say like, did you fix something? Because now I hear things well. <laughs> and it'd be like, no, no, you fix, it, you fix it yourself. So I would even go as far as you don't need to have the visual calibration, but you can have a proprioceptive and audio calibration in this case, which means that this type of HRDF recalibration works even without the visual input, if you have a prolonged uh, exposure. Few things that you can do with audio uh, in, in VR and com spatial computing in general is having people talk at the same time and still pick up which one you want to listen to, right? Uh, like you go to, to the bars or restaurants and you can pick who are you listening to despite all the noise or all the people who are talking. And that's called the cocktail party effect. And there are other effects that you can explore also like the macro effect. And this will have very interesting, uh, uh, important repercussions on, on this idea of um, video conferencing in, inside VR, right? Uh, because we can play around separating people in a space, et cetera. And then a few of the other things we can do with the, with the spatial audio have to do with having an, an experience around the real world. So it's more like an augmented reality experience. And this is a, a work that we've been doing on creating mental maps with the Soundscape app. I'm going to just play the video right now. Uh, if you don't... GPS apps on our mobile phones have certainly allowed us to go further and reach and explore places. However, we might have a modern paradox for navigation. At the same time that apps allow us to explore more, they also have the capacity to make us worse explorers. In fact, current turn-by-turn -turn navigation promotes a passive form of navigation that does not support learning or the formation of cognitive maps. We suggest that a different type of GPS navigation might be possible with the use of 3D spatialized audio. By positioning auditory beacons at the destination, users of GPS can regain an active role to navigate the space. This way, the mobile app acts as a compass that directs the user towards the destination. 
We compare this new form of navigation with an auditory turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Despite participants in both conditions spended similar times and walked similar distances, participants explored more in the beacon navigation, which then led to the creation of better mental maps. Beacon navigators made more accurate assessments of where the landmarks were. Here, we can observe a participant finding his way to the beacon. Our beacon navigation study demonstrates that simply by rethinking the way we interact with technology and introducing 3D audio into the equation, we can have real impact on modern navigation without having to compromise hippocampal functioning nor the ability to create mental maps. So here what it happens is that you move your phone and the direction of your phone indicates whether you are pointing towards your destination or not. So that, that type of experience is very different and it's, um, you know, you, if not, you hear the sound for a particular, um, I mean, if you have head tracking um, uh, devices on the headphones, um, you don't even need the phone for that, right? Like you turn your head and you can see, oh, the sound is coming from right in front of me. Um, so that, that's kind of also an interesting GPS area that I think on our mobile. Uh, we, we have to um, think of uh, spatial computing beyond visual only, right? Like you can have a lot of other augmentations um, beyond the visual. Then I think avatars are still a, a big area of research. Um, the thing with avatars, and I think Mark just mentioned this at the beginning, right? Like it's really a very big spectrum. And depending who you ask, they'll think of an avatar as something like your Twitter, uh, you know, a small you picture that you use to represent you. And, and some people will go and say, no, 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 it's all the way to 3D scans. Uh, I work all across the, the space. Um, and there is this paper that we build on, on how to create these um, avatars really um, here. So I'll go a little bit more about these avatars and, and some of the particular experiences that you can create. So one of them is that you can embody these avatars inside VR, right? Like if you experience them from first person perspective and um, you have control over them um, when you look down you see that you have substituted your body with an avatar, right? So there are many things that happen when you are uh, experiencing that. And um, we'll try to go a bit around that. So the first thing I, I started to be quite obsessed with during my PhD is this idea that embodiment, okay, yeah, people have embodiment. They say they have it in questionnaires. But do they really, right? So I started doing a lot of electrophysiological recording with the EEG and, and did things like, okay, I'm gonna attack the, the person, uh, the avatar hand, of course, not the person hand, and see what happens in the brain, right? Like what the activation is. And, and I did a couple of those type of experiments. And one of the things that I found is that, um, all the voltage levels in many of my experiments correlated very nicely with questionnaires. <laughs> so overall, I, one of the things I found from all that experimentation, and I would say it's also very hard to do it because you need to have this stimulus that is repeated many times before you can land into, this is the average response to that stimulus. And people cannot blink while they do this. People cannot move while they do. <laughs> you know, there are multiple uh, issues with the, the whole paradigm to test things through brain activity. And then the fact that it correlates with questionnaires uh, was clear to me that, okay, people should be using questionnaires. Uh, but we need to have questionnaires that are valid and standard and that you know people can compare and and you'll you'll see more reasons later about why a questionnaire should be used every time you use an avatar okay uh, but basically with david hapek we did a review process of all these famous experiments from the main labs doing embodiment 
and we got these 25 questions that would appear again and again, right? And then after that publication, which I think has proposed a, a quite a, a questionnaire that people are using quite a lot, um, we did our own experiments, uh, about nine of them over those two years, and that included 400 questionnaires. And it included experiments from haptics, from racial bias, from um, motor control, you know, all across the board, um, very heterogeneous. And with that information, we were able to see, you know, that question doesn't have dynamic range ever, is not useful, or, you know, this thing, um, it's, it has this importance into the whole uh, spectrum. So we were able to come up with these 16 questions, uh, which is a reduction from the 25. And, and we have just validated the questionnaire and say like, yeah, yeah, this is a, a questionnaire that works for measuring embodiment. Um, one of the other interesting things is that it's kind of hard to break embodiment. Uh, because people really want to fit into their avatar. Even sometimes you add some asynchronous thing and it will reduce embodiment, but not completely kill it, right? Because you're still looking to a body that is collocated with you most of the time, or, you know, there are multiple reasons um, that is hard to break embodiment. So we did an experiment to really break it. And we asked participants to follow an arrow that appears here in the middle. And every now and then we would introduce an incongruent. Um, yeah, so the, in the incongruent uh, con, um, trial, which happened once every 20 trials, the person would move in one direction and the avatar in the opposite direction, right? So it was very confusing. A few of the effects was a delay on the next trial, uh, et cetera. So we're gonna see another set of 20 now. I'll be aware of the hands. Okay, right now. Um, there are many, and this experiment, you can learn more here about how the motor control system react, what was the brain activity, and but definitely there was a spike when the error was introduced on the brain. And I think um, even with that spike, and this is here what you see, the spike was in an N400 in the parietal cortex, it was um, a stronger experience for people who were having high body ownership, right? So the, the more body ownership you had, the, the higher the, the spike. So um, that is also interesting. Then there are many effects, right? Like this idea that people wanna follow their avatars. Uh, we did a whole experiment from, you know, this was something that was known kind of empirically, people knew that people love to, to sit and in front of their avatars. Like if you ask someone to sit here, they'll rapidly put their hands wherever the avatar hands are, right? Like, oh, how am I sitting, right? And, and try to fit. Uh, and then there are all these other things that affect behavior inside the avatar, uh, which is like, how do you respond to avatars? How do you respond inside VR? And there are many, uh, results that point into realistic behavior. So people behave realistically in front of virtual reality and in front of avatars, right? Uh, from the pit experiment in which you would put people to look out of a fall or a cliff and they would have this very strong physiological reaction like a heart rate increase, etc. To the experiments we did on Milgram obedience to authority in which um, you know, we replicate that experience of electroshock in, in this case, an avatar. And, and we find that people wouldn't want to do it, et cetera, right? But the best transition. So then the other part on avatar research, which I think it's also an area that we're seeing a lot of progress is on this, do they need to look like me? Do they need to be animated? And the answer is yes, they need to be animated. And maybe, no, they, maybe it's okay if they don't look like you. Uh, because one of the things we did here also with the electrophysiological recording, and this is on the parietal cortex of the brain, is that when you see yourself, you do differentiate yourself from others. 
this is something that is known in general with real pictures, with real faces. And a similar thing happens with virtual faces. It's not that it's as strong. Probably as you get better quality, right? Like this is 2016. This is kind of the quality of an avatar that looks like you back then. Uh, but there is a, a still significant difference here between other type of avatars and yourself. Uh, but what's interesting, and this, this difference, um, you know, between the real and the virtual, it's, it's um, self, it's smaller when you really think that you look like the avatar, right? So it does correlate again with subjective data. Um, one of the things here is because we had so many trials, 200 trials for every face, and there were six types of faces, self-familiar and unfamiliar. Over time, what we found with the self is that you would get used to it, right? Like the difference between the virtual face self and the real self would start decaying. And at the end, you, you had no difference. So it means that you, you were really like, oh, yeah, that's me. Now I can see it, right? Um, when I tried the spatial, I had a similar experience, right? Like this avatar is, is really not me. <laughs> but after I used it for a while, I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty good. And, and I think, but however, partially that was because of the facial animations that were idling, but they were nice, right? And, and here we did another experiment that was kind of looking at that too. In here in the left, you have an avatar that has no facial expressions. It, it's impossible to really have an interaction with that person. In here, we have an avatar that has, apart from lip sync, a minimal eye and, and nostrils and, you know, some minimal uh, livable face uh, here, blinking, et cetera. So we had participants go through different conditions in which they would have a still face lip sync or uh, facial animation plus lip sync. And then they would do this morphing task in which their faces morph into an avatar. And they have to stop it whenever they think it's not longer them. Okay. Uh, we would do the same morphing in the opposite direction from the avatar to, to the person. And a few of the things we find, uh, one is about self-recognition. When do they stop the morphing? Um, hysteresis is this effect that things happen in different directions at different times. Um, for example, very typical in material science when HO2 transfers from water to ice, it will do it in a different temperature when in one direction or the other, right? Um, so the same happens with the face, right? Like when do you recognize yourself from when it's no longer you happens at different times. But if, if you really have interiorized the avatar, it will take you longer to really decide it's no longer you. And it will uh, <clears throat> take you, you know, longer also until you're kind of like, yeah, it's, it's me right now, okay? So that distance, it's, it's gonna get smaller in here in the hysteresis if you self-recognize more. And, and that's kind of what we find, right? And we find that once you have animation and lip sync, you self-recognize much more, and this is significant. And then the other thing that we found is that people look much more at the face when the face is animated. Already with lip sync, it's a great increase from, from nothing, but the, the facial animation is important. And having avatars, it's important not only for, for this uh, external representation or um, what people interact with you, but also for your own experience of VR, right? Like here we have a participant. This is an experience in which they perceive um, they have a tap in one hand, another tap, and another tap in the other hand. So it's tap, tap, tap. Uh, it's a saltation illusion. It's a, a type of illusion that you, you can find more information here. I did a couple of experiments on this saltation 
illusion, including the, the uncanny valley of haptics has a similar type of experience with funneling illusion. And the interesting thing is that the brain will perceive things that are close in time to be close in a space. So if you do this type of um, tapping, like uh, in temporal, like I'm gonna just say tap, tap, tap. Right, so the two tabs, last tabs are very close together. People will dislocate the second tab to be somewhere in the middle. But that only happens if you have a vertical body. If you're in these other two conditions, including the one where you have the controllers, which do give you a frame of reference, right? You're much worse at locating these other tap somewhere else. And that's because most of the things we explore in the world are through our body. Uh, here is another example of body perception that gets altered. If, even if you have an avatar, if you don't have high embodiment. And this is distance compression. This is a known problem inside VR. Um, people will always undershoot how far something is in VR, right? If you ask them to walk for 10 meters, they'll walk for eight meters. Um, so we did this experiment in which we asked them to, to reach across and as um, from, from one corner of a room. So this would be like three meters away, probably. And um, we turn off everything and we say walk there, right? So they see the cross, the cross disappears, everything disappears and they just have to sort of blindly walk to wherever they think the cross was. So the people who were highly embodied had much lower distance compression than the people who were not so highly embodied. And that is because we use our body for almost everything, right, in perception. Uh, I know how big this bottle is by comparing it to my hand. Even when my head, with my eyes are closed, I, I'll do it that way, right? Um, so our body is a very good metric for us to know how big things are. Um, and in VR is the same. The interesting thing here is that all participants experience the same experience, right? And despite that, they had very different responses. And that could only be explained by the level of embodiment. And I think that's why having an avatar is not only important, but measuring the embodiment of the avatar is equally important because highly embodied participants will have very different behaviors than low embodied participants. And I think that happens all across very different experiments, right? Like this is this not a compression. The other one was about um, perception of touch. Uh, you know, <laughs> there are some experiments from UCL on, on cognitive loading, for example. People who have an avatar can do better mathematical rotations of geometrical rotations. So um, it's very interesting, an area that uh, I feel like there are many VR games still and VR platforms that maximum they provide you is hands, right? And I think we, we have to fix that. But so everybody would agree that yes, virtual reality makes avatars more important than ever. I was already making that point in 2016 when I talked to Emily Reynolds for this piece. And I think more and more evidence is mounting, but it's very hard to do avatars, right? So over the last two years, I've been quite focused on creating tools that can allow people to, to use avatars more easily because partially they, they are not using avatars because it's very hard. So I released this uh, library of avatars. Um, maybe some of you would know the Rocketbox avatars from you know, a decade ago. Um, they were uh, created by uh, Rocketbox. And over the course of ac acquisitions, they ended up at Microsoft. Uh, with Havoc, uh, but nobody was really using them, right? And I found them again and was able to release them for the public. And now they are also on MIT license, so you, you don't even need to be on academia just to use it. You can use it for your products or whatever. Um, so 
that was a great thing because now people can have avatars. And, but the, the other thing is, it's very hard. Okay, I have an avatar now and what, right? So I'm creating a series of tools that should allow you to uh, play with these avatars. One of them is this Movebox toolbox. Realistic avatars are an essential component for creating social interactions in virtual reality. However, the main issue faced by small labs is a lack of simple self-creation animation tools. In this paper, we present Movebox, a plug-and-play toolbox that aims to provide resources for motion capture and animation of the Microsoft Rocketbox avatars without the need for professional equipment. Using So one of the things here and this hits very much the authoring part that I, I show as a challenge, right? Is that it makes it very easy for maybe a social psychologist uh, to create an experiment where they are gonna have a bar fight and see how people react to that bar fight, right? Or uh, whatever other experiment you wanna do. Uh, it has multiple parts. Uh, it has uh, three projects in particular, one that, works with the depth sensing cameras and has this capture studio. Uh, another one, which really is a parser of the uh, simple models. And you can use that to, for example, get um, a pose from, um, uh, from videos of YouTube, right? And import that to your avatars. And the third one, which has this finger tracking, et cetera, um, it's a first person experience with inverse kinematics. And it's a project that you would do for embodiment type of experiences. Right. And I mean, some of how it works, you load the animations you just created, and then the avatar just plays, right? Uh, some of the performance metrics, of course, Azure Connect, it, is better than Kinect V2 uh, for many things, including uh, rotations. Um, but then also for Kinect version two, we, we apply some role compensation based on data that improves a little bit. Um, still, you know, this is kind of the performance level. This is uh, the, the parser for the simple model that you know, you can use this as a video from YouTube. And this is kind of the performance you can get of the avatars, right? And then, yeah, you can put them with so many avatars and each one of them could have a different animation and you could trigger it by code or, you know, it's, it's quite an interesting tool to even create crowds. Um, soon I will be releasing another set of tools for facial on the rocket box. I want to move to the last uh, part of, of the talk today on the locomotion, because I think this is also an important area. So when I was running some of the experiments on the walking, right? Um, this is what we found. Oh, we have this amazing, super big city and we're going to walk around and we don't even make past the crossroad. <laughs> so I think everybody, I mean, many people have noticed of this problem already and they have been finding ways to fix it, right? We did an experiment precisely on, on trying to find ways to fix this by, oh, now you're a giant. Um, now you're like just very fast. And we had two versions of this very fast, one on the velocity and the other on the acceleration. The seven link boots applies accelerations. Um, the thing that's interesting, they, they have different attributes, right? Like when you're like this, you can read the name on the door. When you're a giant, you cannot read the name of the door, but then you have this very much better experience of perceiving your virtual body or like, I am a person here versus I'm a head on top of a road, right? Um, anyway, so many possibilities to solve the same problem. Then other problems associated like motion sickness can be solved with uh, getting more narrow um, a field of use as you're moving. 
Uh, we have created experiences that um, use eye gaze so you can have a narrow uh, view, but still um, be focused on whatever you're looking at. And even create this experience in which outside of the narrow field of view, you just have a slower frame rate, right? So you still get to see a little bit of where you are, uh, but without these rapidly moving images. Um, so there are many problems with locomotion and there are many possible things that you can do. And uh, when Max moved out from Facebook, uh, back to the UK, uh, I talked to him and I was like, uh, you know, we wanted to do something together. I work a lot with externals, but it has to be always for sort of open sourcing things and tools. Um, so it seemed like this would be an area of interest, like this whole idea of locomotion. Like I've been working for a little bit on it and I was like, look, it's not solved. There's so many solutions. I don't think we know even half of them, uh, maybe we could start by exploring how many they are, right? Um, we started looking at it and, you know, when we got to 10 or something, we realized there are gonna be hundreds of them <laughs> and we would need something that would be very interactive and it could grow over time to, to really uh, work on it. So we asked Hasty if she wanted to join uh, the effort she had a lot of uh, experience on visualizing complex data. So with her, we built this similarity index, a lot of filters and attributes. Uh, let me show you a bit how the, the, the tool looks like. You can enter on the website too. So there are all sorts of locomotion techniques. Um, we created two types of similarities. One is database based on whatever uh, attributes you had defined on each of them, which ones look similar. And the other is manually, uh, th the three of us and, uh, and Simon, who is also a co-author, uh, went through the each of them. And because we knew all of them, we created a matrix in which would be like, oh, this reminds me very much of this other thing, right? And uh, that's another similarity score made by experts, if you were. So here we're filtering, you know, we're saying like, oh, we want high spatial awareness, low nausea. And you see the space has been quite, you know, it's quite a smaller and, and you can still find in different categories, right? Like you can find a thread mill or a bagel even that will have that experience. Uh, but as you start, um, you know, applying a lot of filters, things get very small, right? Like I also want high embodiment. So you're like, okay, you're gonna have to start walking in place or things like that. Um, so the interesting here is that uh, we welcome new techniques. You can send the, um, all of them to, to the system. And uh, when people say like, oh, but you know, there is like very little we can do and I'm like, Oof, there are so many techniques and some of them are so crazy. I think we're just starting to explore the whole area and it's it's gonna grow and grow, right? And, and as we have combinations, like now we have finger tracking, right? You can do things like that. Um, so, or gaze, right? Gaze, gaze control is also something that is very relatively new. So if you introduce that to many of the other techniques, you're intersecting into creating a completely new experience. So here are some of the techniques that I showed um, to people who say everything has been invented already. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm not sure, right? Like some things are pretty crazy. Um, this one, for example, uh, they attach the camera to your head, like every camera is generally attached to your head. But here you throw the camera to locomote, right? Like, I mean, I don't show the continuation of this, but you can find it on the on the uh, website. This one is kind of interesting because there are many techniques that you would locomote by moving your hands. But in this one, it really looks like you're doing handstands. And the experience is very weird, right? Uh, but it is nice also. Uh, things that convert you to a passive action, right? 
So here I'm locomoting by, by gravity, but I didn't really move, right? Like it's a third uh, aspect that, that's moving me around after I trigger the, the gravity. It's also very nauseating. Um, things that have a lot of potential for accessibility, right? Like you don't need to move your whole body, but you have a lot of control and granularity and you don't lose the whole experience of a um, mental map, like on teleport. Things that keep you a frame of reference also to fix things like um, a bit of this uh, nausea effect. And this one, it reminds me <laughs> of these balls for concerts now that we're still in pandemic, right? Um, how to go to concerts in the middle of a pandemic. Anyway, um, we still have questions, right? Like AR or VR, how far are we on real products beyond devices? Because we all follow up, oh, there is a new re release of device. I think most of the products are gonna be services rather than devices. I think um, devices will, continue uh, improving and adding things, but um, what will bring this to the general public is, is the, the, the software and the product. So this is an interesting way of thinking about which one will win and all of that. Um, so we have 24 hours a day, eight you sleep, eight you work, two are entertainment. At the moment, the way this is working, um, you know, two, if you don't have kids, are for entertainment. If you have kids, forget about it. So VR currently has focused very much on those like entertainment hours, right? Like gaming and, and so on. So it, it looks very small, but it could be much bigger. Instead, AR seems to be uh, focusing on this first line worker that's going to be wearing this in the factory during their whole day or, you know, like more during these eight hours. So it seems like this can be a bigger market at the moment or a bigger opportunity. But I think once VR has good um, displays that you can read well and that you can um, really work with them for eight hours, this is the perfect replacement for the laptop. And then that means this becomes much bigger, right? So uh, it's not very clear. And also, you know, maybe we'll end up with a device that can do both and uh, not so far from now. Um, so that, that could be uh, a solution for all of it, right? But AR is particularly interesting because you know, there are all these parts of the of the economy and of the world that really use very limited computing. I mean, everyone here has a computer, right, on their pockets. And they use it, hopefully not much. Um, but they are not being enhanced to do their work by that specifically, right? Um, they are empowered through that. Um, to sell online or, you know, but not to the actual work. This guy is not looking at his phone while he's sewing the, the, the boot. So the thing with the real life is it happens in a while and it has high fidelity. So if you don't create a special computer that feeds those two things, uh, you're not gonna reach all this population. But I think we're, at the verge that that starts to be true. And a lot of people are imagining a future where you do have these augmented experiences uh, blended with the digital and real, um, especially for factories or so on. Um, this is a super cool uh, comic that it was created by the PTC uh, Research Lab and, and I recommend you checking it because it's very cool. But I think many things here are already ready, right? There are things like spatial anchors that are needed uh, that you can anchor things to reality very well. And these are already services. And this is what I say, you need to have the software that really locks this in place and no matter who comes next, they will go around the space and be able to, you know, have completely anchor uh, things around and explore it. 
right? Uh, and that is a real uh, thing beyond devices that is a real product that people will need to use. Another one is this idea of remote assist, right? Uh, you need to fix something. Um, the interesting thing is that you can do it on the phone, right? Like we say, the SLAM is already working on phones and this will allow someone to just place markers that don't move around a bit like the anchors, right? It's, it's because of a SLAM that you can actually do all of that. And of course, um, this limits what you can do because you're holding your hand. So this is where the wearable really beats on the augmented reality side. Now you have two hands to, to fix uh, whatever you need to fix, right? Uh, I don't want you to overrun because you told me you have really had to go at... Um, yeah, so, so. Uh, this is the end. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there are a couple of people that uh, have worked with me around these topics and um, thank you for joining today. Okay, thank just much, Thank you very much, Mars. To, to be honest, I'm, I'm going to be making notes as we go through as things I'm going to have to research in further. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I would rather, what you call, I'll contact you myself about ideas I've had. Hopefully, would you call, uh, take the opportunity now for one of our students or potential students to come and ask some questions about either your experiences or one some of the things you've talked about right now. Yeah, sure. No questions, everything clear? Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I didn't give more time for questions or interaction, but um, you know, I think this whole area of um, exploration is, is very interesting because people can find different gaps. And I think whenever you find a problem, it's probably not just your problem. Many other people are finding the same problem. So if you solve it, um, it's it's worth the dedication at this point because you're really advancing the field. Um, a question I'd like to ask then, as they obviously haven't taken the opportunity, is um, you talked about week early in the presentation about recalibration and other features like that. Do you feel that the fact we can use people's neuroplasticity is probably something we have to consider? And you did also mention keyboards, and I know that keyboards actually aren't really well designed. A lot of what we use keyboards for are what you call historical um, uses of typewriters, which don't really make any sense anymore. So do you think it's a matter of just uh, things becoming tradition and neuroplasticity? We don't always have to try and make it completely intuitive. We can, we can do a little bit of um, training, a little bit of getting used to the environment. I think uh, neuroplasticity works best when it's implicit, right? You don't need to really do much training. Like these people who went into these experiences of retraining the auditory system, they didn't realize that they uh, would uh, become better by just observing this ball, right? So I, I do think that um, many of these things can happen in VR, in which you're running through multisensory a matching, right? Like different sensors have different accuracies, different uh, performance also inside your device. Um, some particular rendering is king, right? Uh, like usually it's visual. Uh, so you can use that higher end to help bring other things further up the line. Uh, but I do think that intuitive uh, interaction is very important. I keep leaving it to the others, but I'm going to ask one last question before you probably have to go. Um, mm -hmm. I've done some work on treadmills, um, which are called locomotion actually, just this year, I hope you'll be publishing soon, about uh, using both eye tracking and also about trying to estimate. Um, do you feel, uh, one of the things that you were mentioning with locomotion was uh, cognitive maps. So how would you, how do you measure when someone still has a retained cognitive map? How do you know when your locomotion is warping the cognitive map? So there are a few tasks actually on the soundscape uh, project. We There you can see two very good tasks. 
that are related to memory, spatial memory. One of them is whether people remember what landmarks were, right? Like you give them a small map and this is like, hey, can you point where these landmarks are? And then you just they just drop them in a map. And the other one is you place them wherever in a space. You're like, now go here. And you're going to point to where the fountain was, where the, you know, and just point it, right? Like you could point with the controller. And, and you can see how far people get of that pointing. And, and that will be a very good metric of whether they are creating mental maps or not. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for having me and uh, have a good uh, afternoon, evening uh, back in the UK. Thank you very much, Matt. Bye Thanks, bye. Matt. Bye bye. Um, anyone who is staying around, if you guys have any questions about the VRMSC, I'm quite happy to answer questions about that. So I know we have some of our members who are following around or anyone who wants to talk a bit. You know, looking at the, most of those have dropped out now. So I see Alex, I think the people who we don't know normally know see Alex and Bon. So you're welcome to discuss with me anything you'd like to. I'll stop the recording.